Hey everybody, today we're going to talk about mortgage fraud, which is a very interesting topic. Um, the next guest, his name is Matthew Cox. He is a convicted fraudster, a mortgage fraudster, who landed on the Secret Service's most wanted list. Fraud is a constant issue in the mortgage industry and can be particularly prevalent during difficult economic times. This discussion is intended to inform the listener about the techniques that fraudsters may use in carrying out their, their schemes, as well as the danger that mortgage fraud poses to individuals and businesses throughout the life cycle of a mortgage loan. Mr. Cox was sentenced to 26 years in federal prison for his crimes, ultimately serving 13 of those before he was released on parole. Thanks for watching. The Million Dollar Mortgage Experience Podcast. Matthew Cox. He is a former mortgage broker who became a Secret Service most wanted con man. His fraud was nothing like you've ever seen or heard of. He was sentenced to 26 years in federal prison. He served about 13 years and he's now on parole. He avoided capture for three years while he was hunted by the FBI and the U.S. Marshals. And it all started by whiting out a VOR 30 day late. Isn't that right? Yep, that's absolutely right. That's kind that's of That's a very, it... very, uh, succinct way of, of, of saying all that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. So how, how'd you get in the mortgage business? Um, I was dating a girl who worked, who got hired as a, in the short version, is uh, she was hired by a, a subprime lender. Yeah. And she said, you know, you've, you've got to do this. Like, you, you have to. You would was be this like 99, this. 2000 or... Yeah, this was a 90, probably 98. 98. I want to say 98. I'm not positive on dates. I'm not great with dates, but probably 98, 99. Yeah, yeah. And right you were working there. in like, like the insurance industry, right? Right. As yeah. a, as yes, as a, um, an adjuster. I, actually, no. By that point, I actually had lost that job and I was working, I was doing construction. So, you like know, I was, manual labor, manual Swing labor, a hammer. I like to say skilled labor, skilled labor. You know, I wasn't digging ditches, but it was still, yeah, it was still horrible in Florida. It's hot. Oh, it's very hot. Um, so you got in the mortgage business and I think it was your first loan in your book. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention oh, yeah. he is an author also. And his book is very interesting. Kind of the catch me if you can of mortgage right. and real estate. So. Uh, that's why I brought you on here because I want to talk about fraud. I want to talk about all kinds of stuff. You know, this is a cr is a crazy time in the mortgage industry. Right. But um, you know, back to your story, you I think it was your first deal, right? That you you kind of did a little bit of fraud on because of you know tell tell us a story about that. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was my first deal. I mean, I was behind on my car payment. I was behind on my. I actually owned a, a house, a townhouse. It was a like a payment behind on the mortgage. Like it was, I was going under. And I'd really just, you know, put everything on becoming a mortgage broker. And so my very first loan, I went into my mortgage, my manager's office, and she started going through all the files. And she ended up, you know, that's good, that's good, that's good. And then pulled one document, put it aside, and that's good, and that's good. And then when I was done, she looked at it, and I, she said, you, your client was 30 days late on her mortgage in the last two years. Or on her, sorry, on her rent, rent on her right. rent. And I was like, and you know, that was a deal killer. Like it's over. There's yeah. nothing. I, and I was like, oh my god. And she's like, you didn't even look at it, did you? I was like, no. And she said, okay. And I said, man, well, what do I do? And she went. I said, I guess that's it. And she goes. So she pulled out a thing of white out. Went. This is before the sticks. You went. And she goes, white it out. Make a copy of it. Stick it in the file. They'll never catch it. I was like, oh my god. Like I was. I was. I was like, that's fraud. And, and I said, I could, I could go to jail. She's not going to go to jail. She goes, worse that happens is if underwriting, catch, underwriting catches it and really looks into it, she goes, you might lose your job. She goes, but they're not going to. She goes, they'll never catch it. It's not. She goes, trust me, I do stuff like this all the time. It's fine. And so you're kind I of in between thousands of dollars on a commission or losing Absolutely. Your car I'm, or I'm going. I mean, I'm going under. Right. So I did it. Three, four days later, like I... I, I you know, sweated my ass off for about three, four days. And three, four days later, got a call from underwriting saying, you know, when do you want to close? We closed a couple days later. I got a check for 3,500 bucks. I was ecstatic. I mean, 3,500 bucks to me was a ton of money. Right. And then the next guy that came in, you know, my, my next broker, you know, he didn't debt to his, his DTI was off. It was too high. And, uh, I don't know what he made. He made, let's say $42,000 a year, but if he had made 47,000, he could get a loan. He'd qualify. So, 
you know, I pulled out that the white out and I changed one or two little numbers, made sure they all they all balanced correctly and changed two of his W2s and put them in there and waited, you know, underwriting or the the processor, they just call and say, does he work there? Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, they weren't uh, verified. I don't think back then they were verifying the actual income. No, they weren't on a on a verification of employment, right? Right, right. Like you back it was then, like how long do you live there, or how long did he work there? What was yeah, you know, yeah. What's his potential? What's for a future employment? You know, like they have some basic mm -hmm. generic, but they're not they're not pulling out like the W twos. And it, as a result, you know, he ended up um, he got a loan. Yeah. And the next guy, and the next guy, and you know, I went from like closed like four loans my first month. Then it was six. Then it was eight. And it was 10. Then they made me a manager. Now, did you do, did you do that on every deal or was it just the ones it that were like stuck? Like if the, it was stuck, I mean, if you, if you happen to come in and you just happen to qualify, right. You know, which they probably, some did, right? some did by accident, yeah. you know, but I mean, and it, it got so, the problem is it got so bad for me that it, it was, it became so, I had such set up such a system, um, for, for fraud that if you came in and you had any issues at all, I immediately just, my first thought was, do I really want to call five different employers, track down all those W-2s, do all the calculations to make sure that this guy ends up getting you know the loan? Or do I just say, scrap that, I'm gonna say you work for this company here, you've worked there five years, and I already have the company set up, when they call, I can verify it myself. I'll make the W-2s and pay subs. It'll go through perfectly, no problem. Or do I track down all those different, you know, try and put piece together this uh, income? And so when I got to the point where it was like, like you just, half the times I probably didn't even need to commit fraud, but it was just so much but easier. But it was easier to, right. to get to the finish line. Yeah, right. I, had a, I had a whole system <clears throat> down. So do you, um, do you think those, those loans, like some of them went bad? Or do you think they I'm just- I'm sure some of them went bad. Yeah. I know some of them went bad. Yeah. But at that point, you were just like, "This is this is like a right. game." Kind of, you were just figuring out how to yeah. make so, it cut cut corners, and make it easier, make it quicker. Some of them the performed. Person. Yeah, well, most of them probably performed. But and a lot of them probably refied at some point because that yeah. you're talking about ninety nine, two thousand. There, you know, after nine eleven, the rates just tanked down. Then we got stated income, and then it just got easier and easier and easier to do loans. Right. You didn't probably have to do that kind of. stuff. I didn't really have. You know, this people always mention the stated income, but like I didn't do stated income because it was too early, right? In the in the well, industry. Or? No, they they were, they were stated income loans, but why would I do a stated income loan, and you get stuck with a higher interest rate when I can get you a lower interest rate and charge you points on the back of the loan, and just fake your employment. You know, like yeah. I don't need to, like if I'm, I don't need to do a stated income loan when I can fake your employment and I don't have to get charged back then. The rates were obviously, you know, higher, but I don't have to charge you a 9% interest on your first mortgage. I can charge you a 7% and get two points back. Right. Or three points back. Right. You know, which I just rates have to make were high back then. Yeah. They yeah. were high like they are now. Which right. Is, I just have to make the W2s and base subs. Right. You know? Which to you was, I think back then there wasn't uh there was computers, but it wasn't like it is today. It's not like, you know, Word document where you can you, you could probably manipulate stuff easy. But were, were you doing a lot of white out, cut and paste kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah, I was doing so, cut and paste. Yeah. Um, or uh, you know, I also would just have the blank form and just stick it in the um, stick it in the uh, in the printer, and I already had it set up so that it printed out directly on the form. You know, it, it got yeah. more and more sophisticated as I yeah. went. So. So then you ended up uh, being a branch manager. You said. Yeah, I was a manager for that company, and then that company got closed. I ended up opening my own company, and I hired ten or twelve guys. Uh, you know, it fluctuated. Sometimes there were fourteen, sometimes there were nine. But you went and got a broker's license too, right? Yeah, I, I yep. became a mortgage broker. I mean, I was a mortgage broker. I became a brokerage business owner mm -hmm. and a lender. And you know, we did FHA. Uh, you know, we did subprime, conventional FHA, VA. The whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah. And you had, out of those 10 to 12 guys you had, how much of that was fraud? 70, 80% of it. And were you teaching them how to do it or did it just was... I was absolutely teaching them. You know, and, and some people, I was asked this question the other day, some guys would come in and they'd go, wow, like I, I can't be, I can't be here. I can't and they just stuff. leave. But you know, AmeriQuest had that them. kind of reputation. AmeriQuest, they were, there was a lot. 
people we were i worked at new century back then like in new, oh yeah 98 or whatever right and then new century. i remember us we all felt so much better than uh mariquest because mariquest were the ones that were shady and like i'd hear stories out of friends that would go work at mariquest and they were super shady i remember one branch the guy the guys were using a dead appraiser's license and like making appraisals which i know you ended up doing stuff like that too it's honestly, laughing at that is so inappropriate but <laughs> i know it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a very serious matter in mortgage, right? It's right. fraud, right? You can lose everything, as you know, go to prison like you did. But, but it's we can't ignore that it happened yeah. and that it's probably still happening. I, and I ended up getting the appraisal software and just t doing the appraisals myself. And, and I was using a real appraiser. And you were just filling in the information for I was it. filling out all the information. Or I'd order a real appraisal. Yeah. They they do it, and then if I knew there was deferred maintenance or they didn't use something a something wasn't right, something wasn't right, I I just retype it all. You know, it, it yeah. populates, and then I I use this appraiser's license. I photocopy everything, and the only thing I had to change was I changed her phone number and her email address. Right. And it was almost identical to hers. So if they did try and contact her, they just contacted me. Right. And they had the license and everything, so it went through. So it got pretty deep. It got bad. It got like you got really deep into fraud. And I know that you went on the run, and we're going to get to all that. I, I guess the next the next thing that happened while you were owning a mortgage company and you were doing all this fraud is there was a sting operation. The FBI. Right. Tell us tell us that story because that's pretty interesting. Um. So I I what had. What year was this? Like roughly. I want to say it was 2000, 2001 is when I got. I had a, a, a former employee had started her own company and I had run several of my loans. Your personal loans, like buying houses? Or yeah, I personally was buying houses, but I mean, the great thing is most of these guys are mortgage workers. So it's because I own the business, I can't run my personal loans through right. the business. I can't l run, if someone's buying, let, let's say they're buying my house. Right. So I'm buying houses, fixing them up and selling them. I'm flipping houses. Well, I was flipping houses. Some of the houses, I'd flip them to my my wife at the time in her maiden name. For a higher price, obviously. Right, right. So, and because we're going to keep them. You know, and I, instead of, in, to get around seasoning, I didn't want to keep the house for six months to a year and refinance. I bought the house, cleaned it up, and now I want to sell it directly to her mm -hmm. right away so I can get all my money back and keep keep moving. Right. And so, you know, to me, it was a refi you know, in a way, and I would sell sure. it to her, but I, I couldn't run those through my own company. So I ran them through another company and that company, the people that ran that company, um, she ended up getting in trouble for running a, what's called a straw man scam. Mm -hmm. She got in trouble. She got indicted and she called me one day and said, Hey, and I'd actually refinanced her personal property to get her like $75,000 out to pay her attorney. Okay. And so whatever, I ended up going, meeting her at a, at a pizza place. She said, Hey, can you meet me down the street at the pizza place? I want to talk to you. The FBI is asking questions about you. I was like, Oh shoot. So I go to the pizza place and as we're talking, she ends up telling me, um, she and her husband are there. She says, listen, they're asking questions about you and you know, your wife. And I was like, Oh my God. You didn't tell them the W-2s were fake, did you? You didn't tell them that I own the property, did you? You didn't tell them that, I mean, I just completely you just confessing I just on, on bury tape. myself. And then as I'm sitting there, I, so I started came, coming up with an idea. And I was like, okay, listen. Um, okay, look, tell them this. Tell them that you never actually met, you know. And I start coming up, formulating an idea uh, that might cover everything. And I thought then I'll ignore them. And But you trusted you know, this this lady, right? Because you guys were I trusted her implicitly. Yeah. Of course. And so as she I'm, was in on it, right? She knew this stuff. Oh, she happening. knew everything yeah. was fraud yeah. and she was committing her own fraud. That's how she got in trouble. Right, right. She's wearing the wire because obviously she doesn't want to go to go to jail. Yeah. And she offered to give them me. You know, she they got her. She's got to go to jail. And her lawyer said, look, reduce you know, the sentence yeah, reduce or the whatever. Sentence by cooperating, get somebody else. Right. Spread some of that time around. Um, and so what ends up happening is uh, in the middle of the conversation, she says, Matt, we can't lie to the FBI. And I went, what do you mean you can't lie to the FBI? You've been lying to the FBI. You're lying to the FBI right now. And her husband stands up and he says, I mean, he just stood up and went, we've never lied to the FBI. We may not have told them everything, but we've never lied. And I remember thinking, like, who's he talking to? Like, yeah. I know that's not true. Yeah. So you're not saying that to me. And I immediately thought, oh, man. Like you're wired. Kind of just like, clicked. Like it just that. clicked that like 
you're not here to for us to formulate a, a plan. Right. You're here to get me on tape admitting. And I realized what I just we'd been talking about. I was like, oh my god. Shit. So I said, hey, listen. I said, um, you know, I hope you get something for this. And she started crying, and she said, Matt, I'm so sorry. She said, you know, I have, I, I have a, I have a kid. I, you know, and I had, I had a son. I was like, well, I have a son. Yeah. And I, and I said, listen, just tell the FBI not to come to my office. Call me on the phone. I'll come down and talk to them. Got up and I left. They called 20 minutes later. Like it was nothing. Like they didn't even pretend. It's not like they waited three days. They called Amelia. Yeah. Mr. Cox, I'm sure you know why we're here, why I'm calling. It was like, <laughs> wow, you're not even pretending that these people weren't wired. Right. And then by the time I actually went out and got a lawyer and talked to the lawyer, the lawyer said, yeah, your two friends, you know, they were wired, right? And I was like, yeah, I figured that out. He said, yeah, well. And he, he explained, look, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, you know, I'll, I want to plead guilty. I'm like, I'm, I'm guilty. Right. You know, and he said, and even my lawyer said, well, there's no way to beat this. You're clearly guilty. Yep. So, yeah. So I, uh, I pled guilty to, um, one count of, uh, wire fraud and there was no dollar, no dollar loss because all they had me on was my wife at the time buying properties from me. So it was a non arm's length transaction. I just lied on a loan application is mm -hmm. what it boiled down to. You've lied on a loan application. Which is what penalty under perjury or, or pe yeah, penalty of perjury. Um, if you lie on it. Because there's maybe it wasn't that, that way back then, but on all 1003s, there is a, like when you sign the application, right. you say. Well, it's bank fraud. Yeah. You know, so, you know, they're not charging you with that. With that. They're charging you with bank fraud or wire fraud. My lawyer got them to charge me with wire fraud. It doesn't sound as bad. Yeah. So, you know, it was, hey, it's funny too, because he, my lawyer, when I went to talk about them, I don't mention this in the book. He, I don't think I do. He meant, he said, look, the FBI is saying that you have an office that's full of guys committing fraud. And I was like, okay. And he said, you haven't been indicted yet. I can keep them from indicting you. I can keep you from being indicted at all. He said, we can do what's called a pretrial intervention where he's like, there's no dollar loss. So what the FBI is suggesting is that you go and you, um, basically you cooperate against all of your employees. You've got what, 10, 12 guys there. And I, he was like, and you, other people that you know of. And I was like, right. And I, and I, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Um, you know, which was just like a massive mistake on my part. Um, Cause you thought you were being like, Oh, I thought I was a gangster. Cool. You know, I thought it was yeah, a tough guy. Not gonna talk. I've seen, I've seen Godfather. Right. I, I saw good fellas. You don't talk. Yeah. You don't talk. Not realizing that actually everybody talks. Uh, or pretty much everybody. I mean, you know, cartel members talk. So right. I mean, it's just it's a it's an illusion. Like ninety five percent of of people out there cooperate. Right. But I thought first of all, I wasn't facing any time, so I wasn't really facing actual real time. Even though my lawyer was trying to convince me, you could go to jail for three years. I knew there was no dollar loss. You're not. They're not sending me to jail. I gave him seventy five grand. Said I'm not going to do that. Like if I had known then what I knew now, I would have went out and rented a rider truck. I would have gotten a dolly, and in the Friday morning meeting, I would have walked in, asked some of the guys to help me load up all the file cabinets. Just dropped and, it off the FBI. And, and said, listen, I'm taking these to the FBI. I suggest you guys all get lawyers. And I would have driven off right then. And I would have never been, never gone to jail. You know, they would have all ended up going to jail, and I would have put money on their books. And, you know, they'd hate me this day, and it would have been fine. So, yeah, you know, yeah. but I didn't know then. I thought, no, I'm going to be a, I'm a, I'm gonna be a tough guy right. at five foot six. Um, I'm going to be a tough guy and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hold strong and I'm going right. to, you know, not realizing that of course, when I got in trouble, you they know, all ratted they me. all immediately ratted me out. Right. Right. But so he you know, was the boss. He was yeah. the king. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it. Yeah. So, so, so you what, couldn't work in the mortgage business though, right? Couldn't after. work in the mortgage industry anymore. After that, I ended up deciding like what I could do is what I decided I was going to do was. You know, and I, I think I, I say this like I could have I could have claimed bankruptcy. I could have done a bunch of things. Like my 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 wife and I are getting a, are we're in the middle of getting a divorce. Things are getting bad. Like she's getting everything. I'm not in a position to even fight it. Like mm -hmm. the lawyers, like you, what are you? You're, you've just been you just pled guilty to, to fraud. Like right. what are you doing? You're not in a position to fight this. Yeah, she's gonna get everything. You have she's a little kid. Everything. Right. So you're gonna have alimony, child support, everything. So what, you were kind of in the in a ditch. Yeah. So what I did was I, I mean she she got everything and I started over from scratch, went and got a apartment and um I I decided I was like I could claim bankruptcy 
or I could, you know, I could lean even harder into committing fraud. So before you go into that, I'm, I'm curious because you knew you couldn't get your part of your deal with the FBI was you can't now do anything financially related, right? right. So you're like, you knew you were making a good amount of money, enough money to buy a house, to buy, you know, to, to have a decent place, nice car, put, you know, have a wife and kids and, and really have like enough to, to have a good living at this time. Right. Right. And so now you're, you're at this crossroads where you're like, I can't, I have zero money. I have no way to do, do my job. And so what kind of, what was that process that took you from, you know, I've been doing this small fraud, which is fraud yeah. into like this double down crazy fraud. That's like, making synthetic borrowers and taking social security numbers. And when you went to, to that next step, was it, was it that big for you? Was it a big leap or was it just kind of like, eh, it's the next thing. Like it's not, it's the same to you. Like, I think, you know, so that's a tough question. I mean, that's a tough question just because were you like, were you like pressured to do it? You think financially? Or was there any other, yeah, like, did you, like, I go, like... Have, I could have, you know, honestly, like, I, I, I could have claimed bankruptcy or, or just stopped paying all my bills at all. Right. And gone and got a job and sold used cars. I would have been fine at that, right? Like, I'm right. a talker. Yeah. I'm a salesman. Um, I don't know if I'm a great salesman, but, you know, you got to hang out well, with a car dealership. Well, you pulled a lot of stuff. You pull a lot of stuff off, so yeah, you can sell, for sure. Well, I mean, I, I, I didn't know. Like, I, I didn't think I was ever going to be able to make that much of an income. And I figured I'm mm -hmm. a felon now. And I don't know that I can do much. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do. And so I just, you know, and I just remember I didn't, I just remember thinking, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to move into my parents' spare room, start over. Like, you know, my father already thinks I'm a loser. Like, I, I'm like, it's like, I just didn't want to take a step backwards, if that yeah. makes sense. Right. So for whatever reason, I just decided that I was going to com just continue to commit fraud. But instead of committing like you know i was i would i used to say like you know that's ah, a gray area instead of doing like a light fraud or gray area i decided i was gonna really really go ahead and just start doing the things that i had held back from doing prior to this like that was like the gloves are off mm. and and where before i was committing fraud i was do, making a decent living i figured if i do this i can make a hell of a lot of money and I figured also, I kind of had formulated in my mind that I could do it in a way where the lenders wouldn't figure it out, mm. you know, even though there would be foreclosures. And did you do that because you already had the knowledge and experience of, you knew how mortgages worked, how title company? Yeah. yeah, I knew how foreclosures worked. I knew how titles worked. I knew how all of that worked. Right. So I knew how all of that worked. And... I, you I saw some I, gaps, like some holes. Well, in I mean, like, there's huge gaps. Like, like, yeah. like, how long have you been doing it? 28 years yeah. yeah like you've seen the, the stuff you've seen and you know and and being someone who was constantly committing fraud and getting caught like i got caught all the time i yeah. get caught little tiny things would happen and the lender would call and say we found out this and we found i go oh my god what do you you think my broker did that like i was in a great position because i didn't it wasn't like they thought they were talking to the person who did it all the time right. i was like you're telling me that you think that eddie did this and I go, hey, I don't think Eddie would do that. Like, well, what, what, what I understand? What happened? They say, okay, look, when we get a W two, here's what we do. Right. <laughs> they start telling me Just what they're, it all out. and I'm like, um, as they're talking, I'm like, well, I'm not gonna do that again. Like, or they say right. we we run the person through this system, and if they're not listed in the business directory, then we go we check the tax ID number, and if that's not listed, we know that's fake. And I'm like, okay, so from now on, I have You're to like do this, taking notes this, and... this, this, right. Right. And so what would happen is that very quickly got very good at, at what I was doing. And then I also had people that we did loans for that you found out a year later they went into foreclosure. And I knew everything was fraud. Mm -hmm. And yet they took the house back, put it back on the market, sold it. The, the borrower, you call them up. Hey, what happened? I noticed your house is back. Oh, yeah we, yeah, we stopped paying after about six months. And they'd explain what happened. And, Lost their job, yeah, whatever. Right. Like, couldn't and then, afford adjustable rate. Right, but they never got a call. And they were like, yeah, I was like, okay, but you closed with so-and-so. Yeah, I know, but it was sold to so-and-so and then sold to this other company. And then they, okay, it's been sold three times. They didn't, you know, never, they made a couple, maybe to, to collect, they made a couple calls. You told them you lost their job or whatever. And that was it. Right. And I thought, so they were really just looking for a reason. And the likelihood they're going to figure out that fraud was committed a year later is very unlikely. They're going to find out that a W-2 out of all the documents that, that I changed the guy from making seventy eight thousand to making eighty two thousand. They're gonna they're not gonna find that out a year later. Like, right. So, what I decided to do was I was just gonna, 
I was going to start flipping houses. I figured I'll start flipping. I'll be a full-time right. flipper. But then, you know, I laid in bed one night and I thought, the problem with that is that those houses in that area, you buy them for 40 grand or 30 grand. You put, you put 10,000 in them or 20, you sell them. The borrowers are horrible. Like the, the area is only worth those houses are only worth a hundred thousand dollars at best in that area. Mm -hmm. So I buy it for 40. I put 20 in it, 60 in it after closing costs, maybe helping the guy out with his down payment. What am I going to make? 20, 30,000. I'm like, oh man, that sucks. And then I have to deal with these customers that are living in this area. It's an area called Ybor City, which was really just a rundown area. And these prices are, you know, 20 years ago. Right. But, you know, and I was like, that, that's just a horrible situation. Now I got to borrow with these borrowers who, you know, they, they have horrible job histories. Yeah. You can't barely get them a loan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They don't have their down payment or they have their down payment. And they quit their job two days before the closing or they've been on, they've had six employers in the last two years. Like it's a nightmare. Yep. So it's like, I don't want to have to deal with them. And then the house is, what are you going to make? $20,000? I mean, I will barely have any money. Because mm -hmm. it takes time. It takes, takes It takes months, time, yeah. right. Unless you're flipping five houses at a time, five or six houses at a time, like you just can't, you're not going to make a couple hundred thousand dollars, not in that area. Right. So it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of upkeep, a lot of juggling payments. It's, it's, and I was like, so I thought, you know what I need to do? I need to be able to buy those houses for, for 40 or 50, put clean up the outside or clean them up and then be able to sell them for 150 or 200, but there's no comparable. So I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll make my own comparables. Right. So but you also had to find the buyer of that, of well, that place. But that's the problem. Then I thought, yeah, but now I got to find buyers. What buyer is going to buy this place for $200,000 in this area? They're not. Right. So I thought, well, then, then you've got to make your own buyers. So, which is, that's, that's where you go quickly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's where every, everybody's always like, well, what, you like make that's, someone that's a leap. Like, yeah, how, yeah. How, who, who makes that leap? But right. I almost do that in, in almost everything I do. Like, it's, I'm very good at seeing things from, you know, a, you know, not seeing things from, like, you know, thinking outside the box. You know, yeah. it's cliche, but I'm very good at that. I've you probably were like, I, get, I could make a, I could make a buyer. Right. Like, in your head, you're like, I could make someone up but then you had to go through like get their social security number their di ids and right. all that so tell so how, tell do, how, how do you, yeah, get, how you right so how do you make your own person first right. thing you had to do was make people right so the first thing i did was i i had to you know it took it took time i mean i don't want to i don't know you know you're 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 only like an hour podcast yeah so. you can you could summarize kind of how you like what you did and then you know right so i you know my issues were that to create a fake person you need a social security number Right. You know, and although initially I actually just grabbed some random children's social security numbers out of the um, out of my files, what ultimately what I ended up figuring out was that I could go to social security and I could using a fake shot record and I would make a, a birth certificate. Like like vaccine shots. Right. Yeah. Right. So you vaccine shots and I'd make a birth certificate and I, I figured out how to get the seal, the security paper, all of that. There was a bunch of phone calls. And I figured out how to do that. So now I have a birth certificate for like a 10 month old kid. I, I called social security like 20 times and kept asking like, Hey, my, I told him like my daughter or my son was born in Florida, you know, and was born and, and doesn't have a social security number. They were like, was, born, was he born in a hospital? And I was like, yes. Well, then he's got one. Damn. Hang up the phone. Well, it started where I said I was like 30 something year. I'm 30 and I don't have a social. They were like, do you have a driver's license? Well, then you have one. Yeah. You ever been to public school? Well, then you have one. Do you have right. a, uh, you know, I was like, Dah! hung up the phone. Then I started going, okay, well, my, 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 my son, how old is he? Five? Oh, okay. And they were like, well, that doesn't make sense. Born in a hospital? Yes. So, so then I called back and I mm. said, they would say, born in a hospital? No. Okay. Born at home with a midwife. Oh, okay. Well, does he have a pediatrician or, you know, whatever? And I was like, yes. They said, well, he should have issue, issued it. I'm like, well, he didn't. Okay. Well, then take your son, bring him in. Well, I didn't have a five-year-old kid I could bring into Social right, Security. Right. <laughs> So I called back and I was like, I'm sorry, I can't. He's out of the country. There has to be another way. Because there's always another way. This is the one thing I know for sure. In almost anything, there's always another way. Mm -hmm. um, so I kept calling. And first it was, I said, he's five. Then they said, oh, it's too bad. I was like, I was like well, he can't come. He's out of the country right now with his wife or with, my, with my, um, his mother. And then they said, oh, I'm sorry. But if, if he's older than 12 months old, he has to come in. I'm like, really? Oh, you're like under 12 months. Right. Yeah. Hung up the phone, called back, said, hey, my son is nine months old or 10 months old and um, doesn't have a social security number, born with a midwife. And they go, okay, well, get his birth certificate and his shot record showing that he's got up to date on his shots and he's still, he's, we know he's still alive. Mm -hmm. 
and um, we'll issue you no social security number. So I filled out an SS5 form, created the form, so the social security, sorry, the uh, birth certificate and the shot record went in, gave them the document, stood there for a minute. And they said, oh, that's weird. They went and they looked, came back and she goes, oh, wow, he doesn't have a social, social security number. And she was like, oh, okay, hold on. Came back and said, okay, you'll get it in about 10 days. And sure enough, 10 days later, I had a social security card showed up in the name that I gave them. It's a completely fabricated name. Because you made it up on the birth certificate. Put right? it on the birth yeah. you, you could name your kid anything. Right. So. Um, but so that that that's crazy. Obviously, that's like, right. but but very methodical, very elaborate, very, like, it's a lot of work to do what you just explained. It's I a mean, bunch of phone calls. A bunch of phone calls, but like to like figure that out and, and you know, that, that well, to I, me, it I, seems like a lot of work, but I'm sure for you, it was like a day, right? You just did all these calls. Yeah. It was, and it, it was, yeah. But then um, yeah. once you, so once you have that social security number, how do you, how did you then make it seem like they were borrowing age, like they could get a credit card or something like that? Well, because, so the only reason the credit system, the credit systems, right? The only mm -hmm. reason they know who you are. A lot of people think, oh, well, the, they know who I am. They have all the data. No, they don't. They don't know anything. There's nothing in, I mean, if you're five years old, there's nothing on there. If you're 15 or 18, if you never, ever apply for anything, then there's nothing in the system. Well, these people, these are cards that were just issued. So there's nothing in the in Equifax has nothing. Right. So what I did was truly like a you know under twelve months. Yeah. Synthetically, right? Right. Yeah. If he yeah, not that he exists, but so what I did was I would go I would go online and apply for a couple of credit cards. Initially, I, I had access to you know I could pull a tri merge on someone. So I first I pull a tri merge and it would say no file found. Mm -hmm. So then I'd go online and I would pull a bunch of um, I'd apply for two or three credit cards. And I go back and I would re pull the credit. And the three inquiries would show up, plus the guy's name, the date mm. of birth I put in, because I'd say he was like a 30 year old guy. Mm -hmm. So he's 33 years old. I'd His put the address, address. Yeah. everything would show up. Right. Now, there would be typically a file that says, hey, social security number was issued within the last three years. But every time you pull something, every time you've, never, I don't think you've ever pulled a credit profile on somebody that doesn't say fraud alert, right? Like every time their name is different, Matt B. Mm -hmm. Cox, Matthew mm -hmm. Cox, Matthew Cox, Bevan M. Cox. Like right, all every, the AKAs. Or right, whatever, right, right. Uh, fraud alert, AKA, fraud alert, three different addresses in the last two years. Fraud alert, like, so so big deal. Right. This says his social, social security number was issued in the last three years. I need to stop saying Soch. Because I well, say it, the people who are who've been in the business as long as us would yeah. say Soch because yeah. that's just something we, so especially sure. if you were in subprime, you'd be right. calling it in Soches and, but like newer you know LOs <laughs> probably don't know that that term. Yeah. So I, uh, so now I've got a credit profile. Well, I can't get credit cards. Right, right, right. The guy's got no credit. Right, he has no credit scores. So what I figured out was if I ordered three secure credit cards, which I did, I ordered three secure credit cards. And then I started making so the payments. you had to put that secure payment down. Like you sent Yeah, 300 bucks, bucks whatever. whatever. Wow, yeah. the cheap, 300 bucks, 500, 200. Right. Yep. You know, a first premier bank, you could, they were giving so you You were like investing a, into your scheme here. With oh, like yeah, you money. have to dump some money in it. Right. So, you know, but it, it's worth it. Well, it was worth it. Really, ultimately, it wasn't worth it. But at that time, it was worth right. it. So I got the three secure credit cards, started making the payments. And after six months... All of the credit bureaus generate a credit score. And my first credit scores were like 690, 710, 705. Well, right. back then you needed a 620 to get, it, yeah. to get a, a 620 and you could get a conventional loan at 95%. I mean, right. That's insane. Like, right, like right. what is it now? Like 650? I, I th we do non-QM, so I think it's probably, it's whatever the, the algorithm tells you with like DU, oh, okay. DO. I mean, so if you have a, you know, if it's, it's probably higher no, it's probably a lot, yeah. a lot higher. Unless you're like an FHA yeah. type of deal. Somebody had told me, a, a guy had told me like a couple, few years ago, he said it, he goes, oh, it's, it's 650 now. Yeah. But that may that may have just been his company. He was a, he was a, a Overlays a loan. or something. Because yeah, Fannie might like allow officer. lower, yeah. Um, so so that that's, um, you know, very elaborate and different than, you know, obviously the, the, your story is unique. You know, like I don't know any anyone else that's done what you've done. Right. Um, but then you were, you were doing, so you, you did all that. You had people who, like, cause you, to sign loan docs, you need a notary. So you figured all that out. Right. And you, you, yeah, you were able to do that. Stamps. What? Well, I ordered notice that what I did was, you know, I would make a, uh, initially what I did was I would make a fake 
driver's license. Like I would take my driver's license, make a copy, and then I just put somebody else's picture on that. And then I'd change the name Mm -hmm. and, you know, cut and paste that over that. And then eventually I figured out how to actually make a fake ID using a piece of laminate. Mm -hmm. And so, and then of course, once what I started doing was once I had all these fake people, I started buying houses in that area of, of Tampa, Ybor City. And how many were that? Like five, six, six houses? No, how many different synthetic people did you have? Maybe 10. Wow. So I, I had, you know, initially I started with names like, you know, Joel Cologne, Alan Duncan. But but then I went to like, I, I'd seen the movie um, Reservoir Dogs. So I started naming them like Lee Black, <laughs> uh, Michael White, James Red, mm-hmm. Brandon Green, um, you know, William Blue. Right. You know, David Silver. So, you know, it was like silver, blue, green. And, right, right. and so I would, I went out and I started buying houses in their names for like 40 grand. So I'd buy a rehab for 40 grand and then I'd hire somebody to fix up the outside to clean it up and I would record the value. So when I bought the house, I bought it for, for 40, mm-hmm. but I, I would record the, the transaction form for Hillsborough County for the County. I would pay the extra dock stamps. So if you buy the house for like 50,000. It's, you know, it's 0. 0.007 for every 100,000. So tax, it's 700 yeah. bucks. So if you buy a house for whatever, three for 50,000, you pay 350. If you buy it for 100,000, it's 700. You buy it for 200,000, it's 14. So what I did is I bought them for 40 or 50,000 and I would add the extra, you know, thousand dollars in dock stamps. And so the re- it would be recorded as a sale of one of 195 $195,000 or 205000 or $180,000, even though I bought the house for forty. And you were able to do that how? Just by stating that this, the... Yeah, you're, you're paying the... You're, you're paying a higher tax, so you're able to... to well, when get you them. fill out the form, you put down how much you bought the house for. But doesn't didn't like the escrow title company do that for you, or was it... Oh, well, I was dating the chick at the escrow. Oh, so you I, had I was, help with the... Like, well, I had help at first. Right. But then I would also, you Once know, you figured it out from that, well, even if I went to another title company, even when she and I stopped dating, and I would go to a title company. I would just say to them, Hey, this, this, the, the buyer wants this recorded today. Oh, well, we don't have time. Well, we, we mail it in. I said, well, that's fine. Look, do me a favor. I'll, I'll, I'll go right now and, and record it. Like a special recording. Or yeah, yeah. I'll go right now. I'll drive down there and, and record. It. They go, Oh, well, if you don't mind, they give me the forms drive down. I just add the extra money in there, change the form, record it. Mm. And you know? now you have comps. Now I have comps and I would, and, and I, so it didn't take long before that whole area went from, I think the average sale in that area was like 60 or 80,000. And I, I, I drove it up initially. I drove it up to over 200,000 and then eventually it went up to like 350, um, as I continue to do it because it got harder as I bought more and more houses, it got harder and harder to find the deals Mm -hmm. and I did like 109 houses. I think the FBI said I did like 109 houses wow. um, over the course of roughly 18 months to two years. And so, you know, so now I bought the house. So I, each one of my borrowers would buy five or six houses. Mm. So he's bought five houses for 50000 apiece, roughly. They all get that. Let's say they would all be recorded for roughly 200000 I'd get like an 80% loan, maybe a 90% loan. Like a cash out. Right, and right. so I'd refinance it maybe a month or two later once it's cleaned up. Mm-hmm. And you would have bank accounts with all these synthetic. Yeah, they've bars. all got bank accounts. Yeah. Um, if even if they didn't have bank accounts, and I needed bank accounts. I had actually made fake banks, so I had like Jeez. the Bank of Ebor. Mm-hmm. There's no Bank of Ebor. It was called the Bank of Ebor dot com, and I actually owned the Bank of Ebor. I owned one called you know. It was like GoDaddy, but you bought a. a, a Dot right. com name, and then you just made a website. I made a website, and I made bank statements, so I could actually make my own bank statements. So it looked like my guy had, um, and and had a bank account. And then when I would close, I would just go to the title company and say, "Hey, you know, I closed with companies that knew me, mm-hmm. or even if he didn't know me, and it was the broker knew me. They knew the broker, and the broker knew me. So the broker would say, "Hey, listen, we'd call at the last minute and say, listen." This guy, he can't leave work. Like, he can't leave. And they're like, right. oh, my gosh. Well, the seller's here. They're, tell the seller to sell or to sign. Mm-hmm. And I will drive it to him at work. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much. And they knew you already. Like They, these, they knew me. Yeah, the or they, if they didn't know me, they knew 
the 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 broker right and the broker's like look i'm gonna send my assistant or i'm gonna send a buddy of mine he's gonna pick it up and yeah i'd go in i'd say hey and the broker wanted the commission check they're like of course yeah they're like fine just, he'll go he'll no, no, the go brokers do, all new yeah. these are all my old brokers gotcha they're all scoundrels gotcha so they would give it you know they're charging two three points on the back of the loan plus a three or four thousand dollar like they're they're making seven eight thousand dollars on each one of these right right so i would so i go in and i would they hand me the They'd hand me the file and they'd say, make sure you get a copy of his driver's license. I go, okay. And then I drive or I'd go get my car, drive down the street, get a Starbucks, goof off for about 45 minutes, sign the documents, come back, give them a copy of the driver's license, the fake driver's license, Mm -hmm. put it on there. Hey, oh, I got the copy of the driver's license. Okay. Did everything sign? Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then they notarize it. Completely illegal. Like, like, like you're not supposed to do that at all. No. Totally inappropriate. No. Anyway, and I'd say, hey, by the way, can you give me, a, go ahead and give me those checks too. I'll drop those off. Oh, sure. Here. And they give me the checks and everything. You know, this is such right. a, um, and so I would take the, the checks. And of course the checks are all going to cut out companies, companies that I had incorporated and opened up bank accounts to, or, um, or I would just switch. I would have invoices in somebody else's name. They'd cut a check to somebody that I know they deposit it or just sign it over to me, deposit it into a, an account. Uh, so what ended up happening is, you know, that's, that was going on and on and I was refinancing. So the basic setup is I'm buying the house for 40, fixing it up for 10, refinancing in these guys, refinancing the house and pulling out, you know, so obviously sometimes there's, there's a purchase. Mm -hmm. And then of course, usually the purchase was done with hard money. And then, so there was a, and then the refis were typically done without hard money. So not always, but typically. Sure. So I would when I refinance, the house is appraising at two hundred thousand dollars and I'm getting an eighty percent loan or a ninety I mean let's say ninety percent loan is just hundred and eighty thousand mm-hmm. dollars and I've only got fifty in the thing. Right. So even if I was sixty and it was I'm walking away with hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So each one of these guys is borrowing roughly a million dollars. And after the million dollars or I'm sorry, you know, after I pulled all the money out of the properties, I would then run up their credit cards. Cause by this point they've all got like 750 credit scores. I mean, at this point I can go into the bank and I can get a loan for $15,000 from multiple different, you know, personal loans. Mm-hmm. And I've got credit cards worth twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. So these guys are getting another 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollars on a credit card. So they're worth about a million dollars. And I would pull all that. I would pull that money out. Each guy, in, you'd end up making a profit of roughly five hundred to six hundred, or maybe seven hundred thousand, and then I'd make a few payments on the houses, mm-hmm. and the houses go into foreclosure. Then what would happen is you'd start getting the phone calls from collections, and then eventually, after a month or two, I would, when I take one of the collection letters, and I would write a letter from my borrowers, my my synthetic borrower, my my phantom borrowers sister mm. would write a letter to the collection department saying, and I would include a copy of an article I'd pulled off, off offline saying, you know, like there was like a, let's say there was an article of there was a 15 car pile up on I-4 mm-hmm. and somebody was life flighted to Tampa General. So I would just take that article and I would put my borrower's name as the person that was life flighted. And I would say, listen, my brother was in a, horrible accident. He's currently in a coma. The doctors say that he'll, he may never wake up. And even if he does, he'll never work again. Mm. So you should just take the house. Well, I just gave them a a valid reason with a copy of a, of a newspaper article that says he's, it's, you know, this is what happened. It's a very clear, they don't need to talk to him. They don't need, and so they just foreclosed. Stopped calling. And then they They stopped calling and they, they make a notation. Mm Mm-hmm. They, they foreclose, they take the property, and, and then that's it. Did they, at that point, I mean, they were so underwater, right? But they, they knew the appraisal was there, and so they, when they took the place. Yeah, but this is three months, six months after the house, like six months later. What, what are they going to do? Right. They've pulled this title. They see that even if they see all these other mortgages, they're like, they're all in foreclosure. Right. Like, this didn't happen. On, it's not just you. It's all of his properties. It's all of his, everything at once went bad. Right. We have a valid reason. We're good. Yep. They're not going to order a forty-five oh six. Even if they call his employer, I'm your employer. So you're he not looking over your anymore. shoulder. You're not looking over your shoulder and like worried about anything at this point. You're just like I wasn't concerned at all. There was there was no no, no. thought in your mind no. that like you're going to get the, caught. 
listen, the arrogance is so overwhelming on me that I yep. wasn't going to get caught. It was outrageous how confident I was. Partly that was because you'd had several incidents where you didn't get yeah. caught, right? And so it just emboldened you. If, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Like if you, like, you know, you're, you read, I don't know if you read the whole book, but if you read the first portion of the book, you see that I got caught over and I'm going to call it like over a million dollars by, by a company one time mm-hmm. in bad loans, all bad. And then when, when they would come, come to you to try to get you to pay, you would be like, you know, this is our problem together. You yeah, would, oh yeah, absolutely. You, you, We're you, in this. We need to figure this out. Right. Me, and, and these me smaller and the companies lender. didn't want to, they didn't want to be stuck with a the loan. They didn't want to deal with it. So they were. Right. They don't want the FBI to come in. They right. don't want it to be what happens. You know, you're a lender. You don't want your name. You don't want your name in the newspaper knowing that you've got hundred a, a million dollars in fraud. You've been dealing with a company that's been providing you fraudulent documents for, you know, you don't, man, you just want it to go away. Yep. And I promised I'd make it go away if they ever had an issue. And they weren't even having an issue. They literally sold a million dollars worth of bad loans knowing there was a million in bad loans. They sold them household bank. Knowing that they just sold another uh, a million prior to that, yeah. So at this point, they would actually have had to have called Household Bank and said, you know, that million dollars that was a part of that five million dollar package. There could be fraud in there. We need. Yeah. There's probably fraud in there. We need to. We need to pay you that back. They we don't want to do that. No. No. So anyway, yeah, I mean, I've been caught. Listen, and even during the scam, I got caught multiple. I mean, red handed got caught, and actually just paid the loan back. Paid these guys like one hundred thirty, one hundred forty thousand dollars. You had you had the money. And I had just, the money. Yeah. Right. So paying them, I just need you to not call the FBI. So eventually what ends up happening is this is going great for me, right? Like I, everything's happening. Um, everything's working. We're making a bunch of money. And then a friend of mine wanted in, a couple people wanted in on the scam. They were helping me do other little scams. They're like, hey, I want a piece of this. Right. Like, what right. are you doing, Cox? Like, how's this? How does this work? Yeah, how does right. work? Yeah. And, you know, can I get in on it? You know, so... What's so funny is, you know, initially it was, can I get in on it? Can you help me? Please let me in on it. And of course, once they got caught, like, he, he manipulated me. Right, right. He, um, I didn't realize, like, you didn't realize when you had a fake ID and were walking in signing documents that like, saying that you were this person, that you weren't that person. Come right, on. Right, right, right. How, how much manipulation was involved? So he... Uh, uh, and they so, were getting paid. And they were yeah, all getting, yeah. they were all making money. So he and uh, uh, another, uh, one of my brokers and another guy um a friend of mine they both ended up uh, ended up committing fraud and they one of them actually one of the loans at one of the closings the title person said that the girl the borrower who was actually signing for this person didn't look like her Hmm. like this doesn't look like you the photo on the id doesn't look like you it was her though right this is what always killed me it's like that's that's something you can never account for. Like it was like 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 you know why do you, why why wouldn't you do this again? Why are you concerned? I'm concerned not that I don't think I could do it, but the fact is is that it's the fly in the ointment. It's that one thing you you can't account for. This like how am I going to account for the fact that this woman who is committing fraud walked into a title company, gave her ID in the name Rosita Perez. With a picture of herself, that it was her. The yeah. picture of the girl that's there. The the woman looked at it and said, "This doesn't look like you." Jeez. But it is me. Yeah. No, something's wrong. What do you mean something's wrong? That's me. No, it doesn't look like you. Hmm. The other person there is saying, "No, that's her." Yeah. No, something's not right. And she's like, "No, I changed up my hair color." Right. Like I, I added some blonde. I lost five pounds. Right, whatever, right. Yeah. But that's me. And she's like, no, something's not right. I'm going to have to make some phone calls. Makes a copy of the photo of the photo of the makes a copy of the ID. Lets her sign everything, but won't give her a check. She leaves. The woman starts making a bunch of phone calls. Eventually calls the old owner. They make a few phone calls. They realize that something's wrong. They then find out that we had closed another loan on the same house. Mm-hmm. And they flag that that check. It's like a hundred thousand dollar check. So we give that check to another guy running another guy I have running a scam in Orlando. He's got a bank account. He's going to deposit the check. So he deposits the check, and then the the manager of the bank calls him a few days later later and says, "Hey, can you come here? I need to witness because it's over a hundred thousand dollars. I actually need to witness your endorsement on the check." Mm. He goes, "No problem." So he drives there. He's also, by the way, using a fake. A, a fake name 
And he goes there and um, walks in, and they arrest him. You know, and I, the whole time he was driving, I was like, "Bro, don't go in the bank. Something's wrong." But these guys, these two, are looking at like, like "Hey, he's making. He's probably made three, four hundred thousand dollars on his scam so far." Right. She's saying, "Hey, I, I need to make that. I need this money. Like, she's supposed to make two, three hundred thousand on the scam." So they're they're not as far into this scam as me. Like, I've got plenty of money. I don't need to take these risks. I'm telling them, "Let's we'll scrap them both. We'll start over." No, they're going no, 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 no. He walks in the bank. He gets caught. I get him out the next day out of jail. I get get an attorney, get him out of out of jail. And uh but by that point he's already spilled his guts. He's now working with the uh he's working with the police. It wasn't hard to put it together because all of the foreclosures it wasn't hard for him to convince them that there was a massive scam going on. Like he's got a little scam for 2 300,000. dollars He's like, "Look, I can give you somebody who's running a a multi multi million. I probably guys probably borrowed at that point I probably borrowed over 10 million. Yeah. It ended up in Tampa, it ended up being like eleven point five million. So it was over ten million at that point. So he ends up saying he all he has to do is go online and say, Look, pull up this this name. Yep. James Red. He owns six houses, right? They're all in foreclosure. And they're like, Yeah, foreclosure, foreclosure. Right. Okay. Pull up this name. Green. Green. Foreclosure, foreclosure. Pull up this name. So green, silver, red. black. Red, they're all foreclosure. He's they're like, oh my god. He's like, this is what he's doing. He knew the scam. He explained it. They're like, oh my god. Mm. They contact the FBI. They contact the FD, FDLE. They put together a task force. Three to six months later, I have a buddy come to me, who's a sheriff's deputy, who you I'd also it, you did a loan for, right? I did a bunch of yeah, loans for yeah. him. Probably half a million, maybe a million dollars worth of loan. But I think I did like a million in his wife's name, half a million in his name, maybe. Anyway, he comes to me one more one one. It was afternoon and said, hey, listen, uh, I used to date this girl in Tampa PD. She was a part of a task force. They just handed the task force over to the FBI. The task force is on you. FBI is probably going to arrest you the next few days. And I was like, oh, my God. And that's when I, I pulled out a bunch of money and, and I went on the run. Wow. So and you were on the run three years? I was on the run for three years. And while I was on the run, I borrowed. That's when I, that's when I really started doing the shotgunning scam. Right, and then you change your appearance. Yeah, I had um, I had plastic surgery. I had a, I got a nose job, I got um, a nose job, a facelift, um, two hair transplants. I had I got my teeth done, um, liposuction. So you didn't really look much like your mugshot at the time. Um, you know that or the, 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 the picture about, they had of you. Right? Yeah, the thing about plastic surgery is you know you still it's still you. Right. But so I don't think I changed that much but i changed enough that at one point i actually went into a i went into a title company one time and that the guy actually had my wanted poster <laughs> in the uh, in the from from the secret service from the secret service in the back room wow in his room and he actually went in and i was signing documents and he stopped me well i wasn't signing it he just opened it up and started disclosing he looked at me and he went i've seen this picture he goes can you give me one second i said sure Closed the file. And the only reason I remember is because he closed the file up and left. And I thought, why That's would you odd, take yeah. the file? Like, I, I need to see this stuff. Review it, yeah. yeah. He had already spread everything out, like, ready to disclose. And he starts just scooped it all up and left, which was weird. And anyway, uh, he went in the back room, looked at my wanted poster and thought. Did you know at that time like. that there was there was a wanted poster? I knew there yeah, was. Yeah. I knew there were posters. Well, I, I knew there were. I knew they were looking. Yeah. Uh, but. You know, by that point, it was the same thing. I'd already done multiple loans. And the shotgunning scam was that I was going and I would rent a house. Wait, go back to he... Oh, he yeah. Back? Yeah, he came right back. He he walked back in. He, well, because he looked at the wanted poster. The wanted poster, even though it said identity theft, fraud, wire fraud, bank fraud, you know, um, it said that I was wanted out of Atlanta. And he he looked at my loan application and it said that I'd... I had just moved to the area a few months ago or earlier, but I'd lived in Tampa for like the last four or five years. I'd been on the job in Tampa for four years and I'd been transferred here, right? Mm -hmm. so he looked, and he assumed the underwriters checked all that. Of course. He, yeah. he, he, and he's like, okay, this guy's from Tampa. This is somebody who's wanted out of Atlanta. I don't see anything about Atlanta here. <laughs> and for some reason that made sense to him. Right. And as a result of that, he came back in, put the thing, put the file down, let me sign all the documents, handed me a check for $200,000 and I left. Jeez. 
you know, went straight to Bank of America, deposited the money. Um, but yeah, that what, what I was doing was when I was on the run, because while I was in Tampa, I wanted to run a scam that they really wouldn't figure out they were being scammed, right? But now I'm on the run. Like, there's no reason for me to try and hide what I'm doing anymore. And at least not for a long period of time, right? You could you you, you didn't want something to come up like a, in the next couple of weeks, like no, you yeah. needed to have like a lead, but but the scam wouldn't be found out for months, probably. Yeah, that's the, that was yeah, it's yeah. That's the nice thing about that scam from a from a fraudster's point of view is that it's as long as you're making the payments, you've got months and months. You could you could you could you know theoretically go the entire course of the loan. If you, um, yeah, if you could make the payments, which then it wouldn't, wouldn't make sense. But, it would make sense. Right. You know, it's essentially a Ponzi scheme. But still, what I did was I I ended up renting houses from someone. So I would rent a house, and 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 obviously the scam varies. Like there were times I would rent a house from from someone like yourself and the guy's name was uh michael shanahan so i rent a house for michael shanahan move into his house and then i would go downtown and i would satisfy i would create a satisfaction of mortgage on on the the um on the for the property for the loan with the county yeah. yeah and i would create a satisfaction of of satisfaction of loan for bank of america whoever his loan was with because you pull up a record or yeah i pull up the actual mortgage and i get a copy of a satisfaction from Bank of America. I retype it. I put in the correct information. I then file it. I then wait for it to be recorded and show up in public records. And now there's no loan on that property anymore. Now Michael Shanahan owns that property free and clear. So they never let the lender know that there was a satisfaction. Like there was never like a copy mailed back. Never. Or did you put your address on it? No, no, I put my address. So I can't put the bank's address. Would you ever get a copy? You get a copy of the satisfaction recording mailed to you, right? Yes. And I want to make sure that I get it. Like, you don't want it being returned to the county. Right. So I always made sure it was a good good address. And I obviously don't put the same address as the house. I always have an alternate address. PO box or whatever. Whatever. Right. Uh, and the nice thing is, is, like, with Bank of America, their loans are coming out of so many different places. Yeah. They're not all coming out of one center. Right. And they don't check that stuff. No. Necessarily. So. Maybe now they do, we hope. Right? No, they yeah. don't. They I, don't. I was just, I, I do stuff for home title lock. And I just interviewed a, a county clerk, an elected official, elected county clerk, um, for the county up in, I think it was oh, uh, oh, somewhere in Oklahoma. Talked to him, and he was like, "You know, he's like, he's like legally, I'm we're not." He goes, "Even if we think it's fraud, we legally have to record it. We can't make any phone calls. We can't do anything legally. We can own, we're a recording system only. We can only record." He said, "If everything's filled out correctly, we legally we are we record it." That's it. We're not allowed to call and say, is this correct? Nothing. Wow. This doesn't look right. Yeah, I called a title um, friend of mine, title buddy, and I'm like, I kind of told him what was was going on with your your scam. And he goes, yeah, he's like, you know, I don't, yeah, we just record stuff and we don't really check and we just mail it back. And Honestly, it's easier now because back then you had to go in or mail it in. Now you you don't even have to have like a, a, like I would get a real stamp, a real like a blue notary stamp and sign it in blue and you right. do the whole thing now you can just scan it doesn't even have to be in color scan it send it in and you just click that it's a true and certified copy right or it's a true copy sorry wow. uh, an original click you scan it put it in they record it that's it i don't have to go anywhere i don't have to do anything yeah and so he was my buddy was telling me that the title company like like a fidelity title or chicago title they are the ones that are on the hook yeah. to pay that title insurance or they have to pay off that lien and then they go after someone like you right? they didn't so, here's the thing about that a lot of the title it's not a lot but some of the title companies didn't even pay they would get upset with the lenders and then they would back on them. they would refuse to, to pay the lender on some of these things so then the lender would end up paying half and the title company would pay it so they'd be like we'll split it with you like mm. this guy's fake yeah. you should have caught that not us right and it's becoming an argument with some of them because I trust me on my my judgment my, my judgment commitment, which is uh basically my restitution, my list of restitution has half just as many title companies as it does lenders that right. I owe. And it's like I didn't steal from a never stole any money directly from a title company, but they were a lot a lot of more on the hook. Yep. Uh, so what ended up happening with that scam was so now I, I'm I'm Michael Shanahan and I, I live in this house. Mm-hmm. That what year is this roughly? Two thousand and four. Okay. So in two thousand four, because I took off on the run December of two thousand three. Mm-hmm. So by mid two thousand and four, really early, early to mid two thousand four, I'm 
I'm just I'm just running scams. And right. and so I, I now live in a two hundred thousand dollar house bought by Michael Shanahan ten years ago, and I'm Michael Shanahan with and no you, credit. And you paid off his mortgage theoretically. Theoretically is no right. mortgage. So then but I he's just, still paying his bill because he's, he's right. still on his credit and all Correct. that. Right? It's yeah. not on my credit because right. I created a fake credit profile. Right. So his credit's not showing up on my credit. So what I did was, and I would get three secure credit cards in his name. So I have a little bit of stuff on there. Yeah. And I would then called three hard money lenders. And those hard money lenders would come out to the house. They'd walk through the house. They'd come back and they'd go, that's worth about 200000 What do you want to borrow on it? I'd go, ah, can I get, can I get 200 And they'd go, oh, I'll give you $150. Mm-hmm. And I'd go, oh, all right. right. And so they, I then would close on Monday. I would close two of them. And then maybe went Tuesday or Wednesday, I'd close with another one because, you know, there's a lag time. Right. And so I end up with $450,000 on the house. And they're not checking title to see if another mortgage happens. No, no, they 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 are checking, but the title company checks and says he owns the house free and clear. They then we sign all the documents, they prepare everything, and then maybe a week after the closing, they mail it in. And then let's say it takes a week or so to show up. They don't go back and check to make sure there's nobody got in front of us. Right. Like it's it's called the gap period. It's a, it's a gap in 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 coverage that they automatically cover. That's part of their insurance. Yeah. Part of their insurance. Yep. So, would you use different title companies? Oh, of course. I can't yeah, close yeah, yeah. the t- same title company. Like, weren't you here yesterday? Weren't <laughs> you here two hours ago closing right. on this thing? Like, you know, right. they, they're not, you know, they're not stupid. So, uh, yeah, I had, like, I had one house I closed on, like, six. I did, like, six of these. And at, at this point, I was on the run, too. So, I'm concerned because these are fake IDs that I have. And what I would do is uh, I needed to get real people. Right. And so I started surveying homeless people. Like I'm realizing now, like what a psycho I sound like. Like yeah. it, 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 it's, you know, <laughs> I read the story in the book. I'm like, this is not, this is crazy. Oh my God, this is crazy. Yeah. Did you, you know, I was on soft white underbelly. No. I'd had a horrible, like a horrible day, like the night, the day before and a horrible day when I did soft white underbelly and I come off, I'm, I'm irritated. I'm pissed off. I'm angry. And I give the, I give, I tell my story on that and it, I, and I just sound like such a psychopath, like just not, I mean, just it's, it's, it was kind of like seeing a mirror and like seeing like what was really yeah. going on. And yeah, it's because a, it's, it's a great, it's, it's a great interview, yeah. but when you watch it, you're like, this dude's, this is terrifying. Yeah. I watched the Vlad one. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was just a little irritated by Vlad, and Vlad yeah. too. Um, well, I mean, I could see where, like, you know, we, if we're watching, <laughs> if we're watching Catch Me If You Can, right, yeah. you're rooting for, you know, Leonardo, yeah. and he's doing shit like this, right? right. And, and people just, for some reason, when it's on the big screen and it's Leonardo DiCaprio, and you feel well, sorry for him, yeah. and, well, and, and, and and when you when you read my book, when yeah. you read my book, you're you're kind of rooting for me in my book because you see the whole backstory. I tell the right. backstory of just basically all the things that went into creating this complete narcissistic prick. Right. That I am, but you feel for me. You realize, like, this guy had a rough time. Like, right. you see the motivations. You can but, see the steps. It's right. not like you're seeing this massive leap, but you see all the steps that kind of led up to it. But in this environment. Yeah, you're going to go, like, oh, hey, John, you're, you're, you own a mortgage company. You're interview- <laughs> interviewing the most infamous fraudster in the mortgage I, industry. I get it. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, yeah. it's like something that, you know, I had to come to grips with. Like, how do I present this to my audience? Like, how right. do I get it without, like, Making it seem that that you know I'm I'm not endorsing because it obviously yeah, yeah. It wouldn't endorse that, but like just bringing it to light that this you know oh. this does happen a lot. And actually, there's the the fraud the amount of fraud that title companies see today is way more than it was like yes. back when you were doing it. So you were kind of like a pioneer in the, in the fraud thing, right? Like yeah, even the synthetic identities like nobody was doing synthetic identities right. when I was doing. Now there's lots of people doing it. Yeah, it, there's like a co- they, whole cottage industry. They're doing it on Instagram, Facebook. They're using love and loneliness to like lure people with these different profiles that people are making. It happened. It happened to me actually, where a lady actually called me and she thought she had a relationship with me online for two years, thinking that I was this person that was sending her flowers. She would buy like little Google Play gift cards, send them to my kids. They had like my kids' names and everything, and and bro, that, you know, I had my wife. You on the should phone. be on my. You should be on my podcast. That or I. Sh- I need her number. That's a great story. <laughs> she this this lady was crying because she thought she she was in love with me, and I'm like, I've never met you. 
she was in the East Coast. And anyway, so I'm saying like this kind of stuff now that like Instagram, yeah. and it's so easy to take people's photos and get like their, like, yeah, their, like what the they're Tinder doing. swindler type thing. Yeah. Yeah, like, that's a great, yeah. And like Anna Delvey. Like, oh, she's the worst, bro. <laughs> She makes me embarrassed to be a con man. I mean, she's so just as when I when I despise you. Yeah. Like I like arrogant people, and I, she's so overboard. It, it's it's I'm disgusted every time I see her. It's like God, you're horrible. Yeah. So like back to that point was, you know, like I'm reading your story. We're seeing like you know we all like like movies like uh, you know of course the Italian Job, yeah. Catch Me If You Can, all of them, Hustlers. right? Hustlers. Yeah. Of and, and you know Ozark. Like you just yeah you, we're, we're we're enamored by this stuff, but then like. You know, obviously, it's it, where the rubber meets the road is like when shit, you went to prison, and that they don't glorify that, right? These oh, movies no, no. don't glorify that. No, no, it ends when I go to prison. It, yeah, <laughs> and that, <laughs> this, no. and that right no there, difference. you know, all these, you know, it's like a gambler. You hear about their winnings, right? But you don't hear about the losses. Yeah, yeah. But like, so your story is, is fascinating, but then it gets dark probably when you, you know, yeah. Like you, I think you said when you got sentenced to like. I think it was 50 years, and then you got it reduced. No, to, no, I got 26 years and four months. And and when that judge said that, what you you just broke down? Bro, like like a small child, like you've never seen anybody cry like I cried. Like yeah. you 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 may have never cried at, at, to the depth of how bad I I realized I at the situation I was in. Because you probably you know? thought you might be able to get out of it. Well, I did, but look, even if you think you're getting your sentence cut. Yep. in half within a week and it's in writing mm -hmm. you would still cry like a small child even if you got your sentence cut you're still even, even look, going to prison for two months if you're going three for months. six months a year two months it's always you never think you have it coming yep. and it's always hard, it's always it's always more than you anticipated yep. like if you thought I've only listen whole time I was locked up 13 years I only met two people that ever told me I got what I deserved. I'm good with it. This is, I had it coming. So tell us how you got caught. Cause you probably thought you'd never get caught, but you were in Nashville, I think at the time, right? Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, so I was in Nashville. Because, and I think you were trying to kind of become legit. Well, I, okay. Initially I, so listen, after keep in mind, I've at this point on the run, I borrowed like three and a half million. Yep. Um, and then probably honestly another million dollars while I was in Nashville. So I bought like borrowed like three and a half, maybe uh, no, that's probably probably a total of three and a half million. And I'd finally relocated in Nashville, and I was I was trying to put together kind of like a a development company, right? Mm -hmm. Like I bought a bunch of properties, I'm refinancing the property, kind of doing the same thing again, you know? Because I've had a, at this point I've had a bunch of close calls. Um, I've called the FBI. I know they're looking for me. Like I know the FBI, Secret Service, everybody's looking for me. Right. I got caught in a bank one time. Talked my way out of that. Uh, they actually let me go. They didn't realize that I was the Secret Service's most wanted at the time. Like I've, I'd had some close calls. Right. So, yeah, I'm in prison. I'm, I'm in prison. I'm sorry. I'm in Nashville, and um, Dateline NBC was about to run a, a one-hour special on me within a few within a month or two, and I knew that we knew that was coming out. The girl I was dating knew who I was, and so she knew that was coming out. And so what we what we did was we started pulling money out of properties. I, I realized okay, I've got to leave the United States because yep. it's, it's just over. Like I thought I could re kind of reintegrate into society and kind of let it die down and just run a legitimate business, but it, it, it was it continued to get bigger. I was in Fortune magazine. Bloomberg was running articles. Most wanted. Chicago, I mean, like uh, Chicago Tribune's doing a series. Right. I've had like 30, 30 some odd articles in newspapers. Uh, so yeah, I. I start pulling, we start pulling cash out of the bank and I was going to go to Australia and my girlfriend and I had a friend and she, my girlfriend told that friend who I was and that we were leaving. But you didn't, you, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, no, I didn't know that. And so what she did was she turned around and she contacted the secret service and she arranged for a $10,000 reward mm. to turn me in. And so they, they watched my house for a few days and then one day. I came home, and when I came home, the Secret Service just the, they pulled up on the the SUVs and locked up their brakes and jumped out of their cars with the guns and the whole thing. You you've seen it, yep. you know you see you've seen TV and it's just right. get on the ground, get catch on him. the ground. Yep. I drop down the ground. They handcuff me. They put me up. They hold up my picture. They say, you What's know, what's going boom. through your mind at this moment? You know what? I was so numb, 
And honestly, what was going through my mind is such a, uh, it was so ridiculous. Um, the whole week I'd been telling my girlfriend I wanted to see Casino Royale with James Bond. Because mm -hmm. whole week she's saying, hey, this weekend we're going to do this. And I go, that's fine. We can do that. Yep. But on Friday, we're going to see Casino Royale. She's, I know. Okay. That's right, done. Right. Hey, hey, we're doing this on, I know, but on Friday, and she, I know, Casino Royale. <laughs> you wanted to see that movie so bad, yeah. So when they handcuff me and brush me off and the guy says, hey, Mr. Cox, we've been looking for you. My first thought was, I'm not going to be able to see Casino Royale. Oh my God. I'm not going to see it. I actually did see it about. <laughs> that was your first thought. My first thought. About four years, four or five years later, I saw it in, in prison. Okay. Um, so yeah, I get grabbed. Um, I get interviewed by like are i you, love it are you thinking that there's a chance you're going to get out of this once they grab you or I, no you're, you're I'm done thinking i didn't think i was going to get as much time as i thought but you, you thought know, you uh, might like get off for like you know like a parole or, or, or what's oh no I, I knew i was going to prison you knew you were in a prison oh i knew i was going to prison okay. bro there's no way I'm but you thought maybe a year two years three years something like that no no i i yeah i figured maybe i'd be out in, in three or four years maybe five years right. but then when they started saying you know 20 30 when the newspaper saying like fuck 50 150 years 50 years um and then my lawyer there my lawyer saying you know my lawyer in the 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 they, it's called a precedence report they're saying you're looking at at 30 years like it's like what and so eventually mm. i end up with i get sentenced to 24 years and keep in mind i'd love to say that you know when they came to me and said hey why don't if you cooperate we'll reduce your sentence that i'd love to say that i i stood strong and i said you know i'm not telling you nothing but listen, man, I said, what do you want to know? Like, I'll tell you whatever you want to know. So the problem was by the time they caught me, everybody in my case had already cooperated against me. Mm -hmm. So b being on the run really put me in a bad position because everyone who cooperated, people had already gone to jail and were getting out of jail. Wow. So I'm, I'm in a position where even though I, I did cooperate and I tell them everything, like they know almost everything. And, and so it wasn't helping they, the case. It, to well, get it you wasn't, and some people do sentence or whatever. And, and it would have helped, but by this point, the economy starts to collapse. This is 2007. By the time I'm right. cooperating, implodometer. Right. Yep. So it's like, okay, do we investigate this 15 million dollar fraud, or do we investigate this hundred million dollar fraud that's happening right now, mm -hmm. or this half a million or half a billion dollar fraud that's happening with this company or this? Eight hundred million dollar bank that just we just found out. Like, do we do that or we do this one that's three and four years old? Right. They already so, knew they got you in prison. They're like, eh, whatever. We got him. He's, he's done. He's yeah. pled guilty. Yep. So, yeah, they didn't one, care if you got a reduced sentence. Correct. One of the things I did was I I was interviewed by Dateline. They asked me to be interviewed by Dateline. The U.S. government did. So I was interviewed by Dateline, and then once I got to prison, I was asked to write an ethics and fraud course that is used to teach. Mortgage brokers. Uh, I think I went through that course. Yeah, about yeah. Uh, Jim Montram teaches yeah. it, and so I that was asked to write that course with Jim Montram, which I did. I was asked to be an, interviewed by American Greed, which I was. So I did all of that, and then eventually there was some arm like we don't, I don't think we have time to go into it, but there was an arm twisting involved, and I eventually they cut my sentence by seven years for that. So now I'm down to like 19 and a half years, roughly. Um, then I end up ha just so happened another inmate con made the mistake of confiding in me yep. and told me where he'd hidden Ponzi scheme money. So he had robbed, he'd committed fraud and uh, basically robbed a bunch of uh, pension funds mm. and churches of 50 some odd million sounds dollars. Sounds like a great guy. He, yeah. He, <laughs> I actually liked pension him. funds. I actually liked him, but churches, then he, he never like retirees and he never stole are, anything from me. But right. he actually told me where he had hidden some of these funds, and he was actually cooperating against his co-defendants. Mm. So I end up mentioning it to my attorney. My attorney calls the Secret Service. Secret Service calls me, and I explain to him this is what he told me. They end up finding the money and reindicting him. He got six more months added to his sentence, but they knocked three years off my time. So you're starting to see like, hey, this no, is... No, I'm sorry, five years. They knocked five years so off my time. So you had seven knocked down or nine? No, seven? so it was seven. Then, then it was an extra five. five. It's 12 years off my sentence. <clears throat> by that point, by the time that happened, I basically, my time was How many was years cut. Left, left did you have at the point? I had like a year and I went to halfway house. Went straight to, went to a halfway house within a few months. So I go to the halfway house and uh, yeah, and then uh, that was three years ago. Wow. Yeah.
And you just been on a like a podcast circuit. A I've little been on bit. a podcast. You've written some books. Yeah, and I've got like programs coming out about me and yep. documentaries and all kinds of stuff. Like, I mean, you got the short version, you know. Right. Book. Yeah. I mean, you're you're on the internet. That people find it, find your story. I think it's yeah. worthwhile listening to the whole thing and reading the book. And um, you know, it's 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 kind of like. You know, the mortgage business, you know, the big short came out back in 08. That's you know, we got movie. so like the mortgage people, you know, kind of all related to some of that, right? With the, the way that the stated income loans were and all that. <laughs> we related yeah. to it, but like, you know, like Catch Me If You Can was interesting, but like, I guess I want to get back to before we wrap this up is like, you know, was there ever a time when you're just like, I got to stop this? I got, I'm gonna get caught. I gotta, I just, I gotta get out. I gotta figure this out. I know you said you want to go to Australia, but like earlier on or along the path, was there any ever like any kind of real like shit? I need to just, oh, I, I, get... I had there were multiple times, but you mean like when I was on the run? Yeah, or maybe even before I that. I mean, there were multiple times. The problem is every time I got caught, I just became emboldened by it. I just thought, I, I thought because I was you got out because you got, got out. out. Yeah. I just kept getting. It's Listen, kind of like that kid who gets, you know, gets away with all kinds of stuff and they're never disciplined and then they just right. get worse and worse and worse. Right. Or or even they get caught and they say, whoa, 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 that's not what happened. Here's what happened. Here's the boom. And they spin it enough that the parent goes, okay, just, that's fine. Go. Right. Like they like, it's like, wow, I just got caught and I convinced them that I didn't do it. Right. Or I, you know, I spun it in a way that, hey, no, 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 I was here. I didn't come in late. Yeah. I came right in. Dad, you were sleeping in front of the TV. What are you talking about? Right. I so walked right by you. Right. He's like, you. And then they question did? themselves. Then and they yeah. go, I did. I was, I think I may have dozed off. Damn it. Yeah. You know? Right. So I- anyway, uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I, there were, there were both, and there were multiple times when I got caught. I mean, I got caught, like I got handcuffed and brought downtown one time. I got convinced them that I, that the bank had an issue. There was a problem with the bank. Like I didn't do anything wrong. They let me go. Right. Uh, you know, there were, there were times when I got caught and I just paid them back, mm-hmm. convinced them that let me just pay you the money back. And I actually just paid the banks back. That happened multiple times. Right. They called me. They said, this is fraud. You've committed fraud. Yeah. And I've said, yeah, I get what you're saying. How much do I owe you? Let me just cut you a check. Let's not call anybody. And they said, okay, give us our money back. And I cut them a check for a hundred grand or 200 grand. And so you kind the, of always thought in the back of your head, like I can get out of these. I things. just, you know, yeah. I just was so arrogant and such, you know, the, the, super arrogant it was yeah. just it really it really was just straight arrogance yeah. on my part and uh i guess the last question i want to ask you is uh, you know what would you say to someone who may have dug themselves a hole right like it's like a mortgage broker out there that's listening maybe they kind of dug themselves a hole a little right. bit they're not as far as long as you might have been but they're like you know they're at that stage where they're like you know well, the, the, that see, that's those are multiple questions. So, because here's, I've actually had guys that have contacted me not for mortgage fraud so much, but I've had kids that have caught twenty five year old whatever, and and they're they they've dug themselves into holes. Yeah. And of course, what they don't want to hear is that at this moment, the FBI or the Secret Service don't know that you've done anything wrong. Right. Like you're good right now, if you get a lawyer. Go to them, explain to them the issue. Mm-hmm. You can do most of the time. You can do a pre. You can cooperate and do a what's called pre-trial uh, pre-trial um, intervention program, mm-hmm. where you fix the situation in some to the best of your ability. Not always. You borrowed. Excuse me. You, let's let's say it's six million dollars. You're five million dollars that you owe. You can't pay them back five million dollars. Right. But you can negotiate something. You can work on it. Let me pay this. Let me owe this. Like I can owe the money. Yep. You can usually work a deal out if they don't know yet. Or there's an investigation that hasn't uncovered you yet. Like if the investigation's on its way and you're gonna you've already been indicted, yep. like it's cooperation is, is your only real chance. Now, if you're in a situation where you've been doing something and it may or may not get um, discovered. You know, then you've got to roll the dice. You have to figure out, like, is this something that I can stop doing and just hope none of this catches up to me? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. You know, but if you're in a situation where you're like, no, ultimately it's going to go bad. Right. Then you need to address it head on immediately because typically if you go to with them with a lawyer, don't be stupid and walk in and think, oh, I'm just going to, I'm good. I'm going to negotiate my way. Listen, these people are sharks. Yep. They, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, Secret Service, all of those organizations are allowed to lie to you. 
Mm. So and, and to think, oh, well, they won't lie to me. The, the hell they won't. So you go in with a lawyer that's got it on paper. He's now a witness that they said this, they said that, they have promised this, they agreed to do this. And you can typically, a lot of times, you can get in front of it and really mitigate the, the, the issue. Mm-hmm. Once they're on to you and then you start trying to dig yourself out, like you're in a much worse position. Yep. The difference between pre-indictment and indictment is massive. Wow. So at the end of your book, um, you say, in the book, The Shark in the Housing Pool, that you missed the thrill of committing fraud. What I think it was on a, uh, not on a daily basis, but um, that it worries you to no end. Do you think that it was kind of an addiction? Oh, yeah. I, I, I think like, and, and this is the thing, like I think about it all the time. Probably because you have, you, your mind is just active, right? Like so you have const- ideas about yeah, stuff. And- I constantly think about it. I, I, you know, but it's, it's almost like I would say like, it's like an alcoholic. It's like, well, eh, I'm not going to do anything today. Like, like, you know, I can't say never because the truth is you, you don't know what's going to happen. You're in the worst situation. Listen, everybody under, under certain circumstances, anyone will commit a crime, you know? Right. Uh, so, you know, do I, can I say never? No, but I, I, I know that, you know, it does worry me that I that I do think about it, but you know the problem is after being in prison for that long, like things are too good out here. Right. Like you have no idea. Like you probably you underestimated no the freedom aspect. Oh my God! You have no idea how good it is out here. Like it's amazing. Like YouTube even with is no amazing. money, right? Like even with not that much money, like no, not you living don't really fast have that cars. Many money. Right. Look, listen, with with a, a minimum wage job, I mean, you could basically, yeah, you'll be living in someone's spare room, but you still have YouTube and and you have Netflix and you can still do stuff and you, you can, can see still casino royale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you could still, you still have options. Like when you go to prison and that door closes and you're gonna do ten years, like your op, your options are over. And if you think, I always love these guys, like you know, well, my wife, oh, she's gone, bro. If you oh, think yeah, your wife's yeah. waiting ten years for you, no, no. And, and even though she lived off of the fruits of your illegal proceeds for all that time, she's going to now think of you as a scoundrel scumbag. And you're and thinking, all her friends too. Of course, her friends are going to say, "Oh my God, he's in prison. You go to the prison. Oh my God!" Like, trust right. me, it's. Listen, listen. It's you know, like you better to get in front of it, get in front of it, and try and fix it because everybody that you think this is the other funny thing. Everyone you think will be loyal to you and stick by you won't. And the people that, you th- that you've never done anything to or for and you don't think owe you anything, those are the people that will actually come visit you in prison and put money on your books. Those wow. are the people that will give you a place to live. <laughs> wow. The people that you may have made half a million or a million or two million dollars, those people will turn on you and walk away immediately. Jeez. It- it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. This has been, uh, I know it's not yeah, the whole I wish, story. I mean, I think. No, I wish we had more time. I yeah, mean, we, we, we touched on a lot of things, but, you know, there's way more online. You, your book's out. Um, you know, you're a true crime author. You did some some other. Yeah, I've optioned for, a bunch of true crime stories. I wrote a bunch of true crime stories when I was in prison. Right. Yeah, but, you know, fraud's never worth it, of course. You know, this is a mortgage podcast and it's. You know, we look for it. You know, I'm going to pick your brain a little bit on what to look for, like, you know, on files that come in, you know, and stuff. It's just, yeah. it's prevalent still. It still happens. And it's, I think with like the, the rising rates, there's temptation for people to close deals that are going to make them commissions, especially when your pipeline's gone. So hopefully you got something out of this because this, you know, if it's a temptation, it's it's not good, right? Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's. In the end, it, it takes way more than it, it, it will ever give you. Yep. It definitely does. Like in my case, it, it you know, imagine starting your life over at 50. Yeah. I walked out at 50 with nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not it's, worth it's, it. it. That's gnarly. All right, so don't forget to like, share, subscribe. And if, if you want to comment, please comment below. And uh, thanks for watching this podcast with us. The Million Dollar Mortgage Experience Podcast.